Chapter 16 Volga the Apprentice, Chapter 3 It was at least a couple hours later but much to his surprise Kira had returned. She brought with her some medicine, needles, a spool of silk thread, a roll of linen gauze, and a few bottles of some sort of hard alcohol. I'm not sure if I'm more surprised to see you, or to see all the stuff you brought back with you, Volga said. Kira shrugged and placed the items on the kitchen table saying, I told you I would return, I'm almost hurt you didn't believe me. Sorry, my more recent run-in with people has made me less than fully trusting of others. Anyways I didn't think that two silver coins would get you the medicine, I can pay you back for whatever you had to spend on it. It's no problem, at this hour everything is inexpensive if you know how to get to it. Kira said with a sly wink. It took Volga little time to understand her meaning. You stole this stuff. Well the shops were all closed so I had little choice. I left the silver for the medicine but the rest of the stuff was cheap enough it shouldn't be missed. You don't have a problem with that do you? Volga looked at the supplies on the table, his shoulder started to burn with pain. No, I guess not. As long as you paid for the medicine that's the one that really counts. Good, Kira said grabbing one of the bottles of alcohol and handing it to Volga. Now drink that, I mean a lot of it, you won't want to be sober when we start. Volga took the bottle and with Kira's help opened the top then started drinking from it. Whatever it was it tasted foul and burned his throat. This stuff is gross. Volga said trying to keep it down. Cheap liquor, gets you drunk fast though which is the point, not for the taste though obviously. Despite the foul taste Volga kept drinking until he stopped feeling the pain from his shoulder. When it was gone they started removing his shirt and the pain flared up again as they did. It wasn't so bad and though he grimaced they continued. When his torso was exposed Kira grabbed the small bottle of clear liquid and opened it up. Before she poured it over the wound she said, This stuff will clean out the wound but it's going to sting and sizzle so brace yourself. Volga did his best to brace himself as instructed but as soon as the liquid poured onto his open wound he yelped in pain and nearly jumped out of his chair. Kira stopped by putting a surprisingly strong hand on his chest and pushing him back down. She held him down still pouring the last of the bottle's contents onto his shoulder. Calm down it's not that bad, you're acting like a baby not a man. Trying to be more masculine Volga managed to hold himself back from any more cries of woe or hopping out of his seat while medicine cleaned out his wound. When it finished sizzling Kira grabbed the small vial of blue medicine and broke the top, then gentle poured the gel-like substance directly into his wound. This one didn't hurt nearly as bad. But as Kira grabbed the needle and silk thread and began preparing it for the stitching Volga decided to drink down another bottle. He was definitely drunk by the end of the second bottle and when Kira began the stitching, it hurt but he was too intoxicated to pay it much attention. By the time Kira finished stitching Volga's shoulder up he was passed out in the chair. Kira sighed and rubbed the bracelet on her left wrist. You better be worth all this trouble pal, she said to herself. She then wrapped up the wound with the linen and tore up as much of the robe that she could, that wasn't dirted, and fashioned it into an arm sling for Volga. When she was all done she grabbed the third bottle of Dayer water and started drinking it herself as she searched out the nearest bed in the house. The next morning Kira awoke before Volga and decided to snoop around. To her disappointment there were no great treasures or anything fancy, least not in the open. She found a mysterious chest in one of the bedrooms but found even with her lock-picking skills she couldn't get it open, must have been locked with magic. She found the library had made up at least a quarter of the house and was lined with bookshelves each completely filled with fat books. On the center table Kira found a few books on healing magic. She grinned and wondered if the young magi would not have been able to heal himself using the knowledge from these books. She didn't put it past him, the young man seemed more like a bookworm than anything, which made her wonder what he was doing at that tavern. Then again, even bookworms get thirsty I suppose, Kira said to herself. On the floor near the table Kira saw a shiny looking paper with a detailed map on it. She picked it up and studied it until turning it over then, seeing the writing, read over its contents until realizing what it was, a map of that devil tower. Thinking it could be worth a good deal of money to the right buyer she rolled it up tight and used some ribbon she found in the bedroom to tie it. Then she tucked it away down her shirt between her breasts and went downstairs to see if Volga was awake yet. He was but he was still groggy and had a major headache. She gave him some time to wake up before she decided to see if he was able to help her or not. At the least he managed to make a good breakfast for the two of them. During their breakfast Volga noticed the white bracelet on Kira's wrist. Lining the middle of the bracelet was a long streak of black going all the way around. 
he managed to summon the courage to ask her about it. How long have you been wearing that binding bracelet? Kira acting partially confused looked at her wrist and said, This ugly piece of jewelry? I got it thrown on me after being set up for some crimes I didn't commit. I was just in the wrong crowd I guess, sadly it's been some bad years without my magic. It's a black halo one too, Volga said. Means you're locked out for life so long as that thing stays on. Kira frowned and played with the bracelet a bit then said, Well it was this or sit in a cell for 60 years. Some days I want to hack off my hand just to get my magic back, it feels so wrong living without something that's been a part of me my whole life. That's a terrible idea. Volga quickly said. Even if you remove part of the arm that bracelet is attached to it would immediately teleport onto the next most available spot on your body. Kira grimaced. Then she asked, how do you know so much about this thing anyways? Did you ever have to wear one? No nothing like that, but my master came home with one a couple years back. He kept me up for a week straight teaching me how to remove it. It was a serious pain in my ass but I figured it out. Eventually. You know how to remove this? Kira asked her eyes gleaming with a long lost hope. Yeah I can but, I'm not supposed to. Volga said looking away, feeling shamed for giving Kira that hope. Well what about your master? Can he do it then, or give you permission to do so? My master is gone, Volga said in a voice so quiet that Kira strained to hear it. I'm sorry to hear that, Kira said, genuinely empathetic for him. It's alright I guess, I got used to life with this thing on, I can continue on with it. She then got up and walked towards the door. Thanks again for your help, maybe I'll see you around sometime. Volga stood up to walk her out and say goodbye but as his shoulder flared up in pain for an instant he called out, Wait. You went through so much trouble helping me out with this cut, as long as you don't tell anyone, and I mean anyone, then I can remove that bracelet. Kira jumped with joy and her eyes lit up with glee. She ran over and hugged Volga. It hurt so bad but felt so great at the same time that he didn't protest, despite the agony in his shoulder. When she let him go, he told her to take a seat as he grabbed a clean knife off the counter. He knelt down on one knee and said, I need to draw some blood from your wrist for this to work, all right. Kira nodded and Volga pulled out her wrists and turned the right one so he could get in clean cut. He made small incision down her wrist, Kira didn't even flinch. Then he pulled her left wrist under the other and let the blood trickle down onto the bracelet, he started rubbing it around the whole bracelet and began the spell. He worked in quiet concentration, gripping onto the bracelet with great force, channeling his energy around the bracelet. Then he suddenly and quickly pulled the bracelet right off Kira's wrist. It came off without a hitch and Kira just stared unbelieving. Volga rose to his feet and said, This needs to be buried until I can prepare a good fire to destroy it, I will be right back. Volga left the house shutting the door behind him. With the boy gone Kira focused on her magic, trying hard to remember that feeling of power pulsing through her whole body. It started with a low tingle in the palm of her hand, but soon grew and spread through her whole body. She rose from her chair and held her arms out in front of her staring at them. They were partially transparent to her eyes and she could see a little bit through them as if looking through a stained glass window. That's what she saw, but to everyone else they would see nothing of her, she was by all means invisible. The last thing she had to test now was her full transparency. She rose from her chair and started walking towards the table, concentrating on her powers even harder. As she walked through the table she could feel the very slight vibrations going through her upper thighs, the part of her that was passing through the table. When she finished walking through the table she dropped her intangibility and jumped with glee and excitement. Even after all these years she could perform her magic perfectly now that the bracelet was off. She would really have to thank Volga now, he really did manage to get the damn thing off her, she knew it was a long shot at best but the kid did it. As she started to put the dishes in the sink from breakfast, and consider how she would repay him, Kira felt the smooth paper rub between her breasts, she had completely forgotten about the map. Now she was starting to regret taking the map from Volga, after all he did for her, it was time to leave before her guilt made her do something stupid. Soon as Volga returned saying the job was done Kira leaned in close to him and gave him a long intimate kiss on the lips. When she pulled back she winked and said, Thanks again for all your help, but I have intruded enough on you and must be going, goodbye. And before Volga could say anything Kira was out the door and almost prancing away. She pulled the map out from her dress and kept moving thinking to herself, that kiss ought to keep him distracted long enough for me to get a good distance before he realizes the map is gone.
Today must have been a dream, a young woman as beautiful as Kira kissing him like that, Volga had to pinch himself to make sure he was not dreaming. He did, it hurt, and he wasn't. It was such a wonderful day that nothing could get his mood down, he didn't even feel like drinking. Things were starting to look bright, until he walked into the library and discovered the tower map was missing. He searched all around the area where he last saw it but when he didn't find it he came to one simple and obvious conclusion, Kira stole it. He laughed a little, of course she stole it, he wasn't lucky enough to meet a beautiful woman like her without something being wrong with her. Now there was only one thing for him to do, get the map back. With her magic back Kira went on a stealing spree throughout the shopping district in town. She stole a nice maroon leather bag to put the map, and whatever else she decided to steal, in. She then got herself a new wardrobe, a tight stretchable shirt which showed off her mid-waist and a skirt that only went down to the bottom of her thighs. It felt great to be out of her silly dress and into more, comfortable, and personal clothes. Then Kira stole some other stuff she had no real use for such as diamond earrings, or dove leather gloves, which was softer than her own skin. Whatever she wanted was up for grabs, it felt great to be truly alive again. But that town was small game for her, she quickly moved on and headed west to better treasures. As she made her camp outside the town, before the sunset, a figure suddenly appeared right in front of her. She stumbled back in surprise and fell on her butt. She soon recognized the figure as Volga, he was very agitated. Give back the map and I won't hurt you, Volga said. Kira smiled innocently, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Volga launched a ball of fire at Kira with his good arm. She swiftly rolled to the side to dodge it but could still feel the immense heat from the attack, he really was not messing around. She got to her feet immediately after that holding her hands up. All right, all right relax. She said. It's in my bag, just let me grab it okay. Volga said nothing but nodded his head in confirmation. Kira then slowly walked over to her bag keeping her hands up and her eyes on Volga. She reached down and picked up the bag, still moving slow, and pulled out the rolled up map. See, still here, she said with a coup smile. She held it out in front of her and as soon as Volga dropped his guard and took a step to her she used her magic to turn transparent and made a run for it. Seconds later Volga snapped his fingers and a bright light flashed around them. Kira ignored it and kept running until an invisible force slammed her hard in the back and violently threw her to the ground. Kira moaned in pain and rolled onto her back in time for Volga to slam his foot down on her chest and pin her to the ground. Thinking he had her Volga went to speak and Kira pulled her legs up, wrapped her heels around his thigh and knocked him off his balance. As he fell on his back Kira kicked her legs into the air and holstered herself back on her feet. Soon as Volga was getting back to his feet Kira spun around and slammed her foot into his cheek with a powerful spin kick. Volga hit the ground on his left side and he shrieked in pain. He turned to his stomach and pulled in his leg to rest more on his knee. He spit out the blood that gathered in his mouth from the kick then got back on his feet and reached into his pocket. Kira didn't even bother trying to go invisible again as this time after she kicked Volga she just ran in a flat run. She didn't get far when a powerful force suddenly grabbed her and pulled her back. She landed on her back and once more Volga was upon her but this time he quickly slipped something around her wrist and backed up from her. She immediately realized what he put on her and panicked trying to pull it off, it was futile. No, no, no no. She cried out in frustration. While she had her tantrum Volga went into her back and retrieved the map. After checking and seeing the map was real Volga said, You know the worst part of all this is if you asked me, I would have let you accompany me to the tower, more than one person can get their wish granted. Alright I'm sorry, I didn't mean to steal it, it was just sitting in the open and I thought I could fetch a nice price for it. Now please just take this damn thing off my wrist again and we can just go our separate ways. Kira begged. Volga said nothing to her and simply vanished. Volga teleported back to his home and went straight to the chest where all the gold his master left him behind was stashed. He had the good sense to enchant the chest with a protection ward and for the time being that would be the safest place for the map. With the map safely locked away Volga went to the library and continued his reading on healing magic. The sooner he could heal up his shoulder the sooner he could move on, he mourned for his master long enough and after all that happened to him the last couple days he was tired of sitting around. With the hour running late he didn't get far into his reading until deciding to go to go to sleep. The next morning, after breakfast, he spent his time doing nothing but reading over the books on healing magic. He learned some other useful stuff in the first book but nothing so simple as an instant healing spell. 
when his stomach started growling he took a break and went downstairs to cook himself lunch. Much to his surprise, and great annoyance, Kiro was downstairs waiting for him. Seeing her he slowly made his way down the stair steps, preparing for her to attack him. You know I have asked, how exactly did you find me so quickly? Kira asked watching Balga descend the steps in anticipation. I put a tracking spell on that map during the very beginning of my unstable drinking phase, in case I ever got drunk, and mad, enough to blow that map to the winds. Volga said, still staring her down as he made his way to the bottom of the stairs. Kira raised her open hands and stepped back as Volga came forward. Look I don't want any trouble, I'm sorry I tried stealing your map, and I won't do it again. But truly all I want is to get this fucking bracelet off me, you proved you could do it once already. And you proved you can't be trusted, even when you owe someone, Volga countered. I have no reason to help you, so leave my house now. As soon as you remove this bracelet from my wrist. Volga glared at her and Kira smiled innocently. He continued on to the kitchen and Kira cautiously kept her distance. You know, he said. I can always teleport leaks away from here, and then you would never be able to catch me, then what would you do? Kira thought about it in silent while Volga pulled out the stuff he would need to make his lunch. She answered his question with, Then I will burn your house down if you abandon me like that before removing this wristband. I could always kill you before I leave, Volga said in a dark tone. You're not the type though, Kira responded immediately. Not yet. Volga muttered under his breath. After a long awkward silence Kira asked, So do we have a deal? Volga said nothing, and regardless of what Kira would say or do he continued to say nothing while he made his lunch and then ate it. Eventually, she gave up but promised to return the next day at the same time, while also threatening to burn his house down if he wasn't there when she did return. With Kira gone Volga was able to continue his reading in peace but the other book he found still didn't have what he was looking for. By the time he finished though it was late and he was tired, so he put the book back on the shelf and went to bed. The next morning he found exactly what he was looking for in the third book, of course. And after a series of trials and errors that lasted hours Volga managed to work the healing spell to patch up his wound in minutes. Kira was in the doorway of the library watching through half of it, laughing at times in silence. When the wound was completely healed Kira applauded him sarcastically, Great job truly, she said. But you still have to remove those stitches, and now with the wound fully healed doing so is going to be harder and way more painful. Volga looked at her then back to his shoulder, she was right. Shit. He shouted in frustration. I can remove those for you, it will be much worse on you if you do it yourself. No thanks I need nothing from you. Volga then got up and walked out of the library, Kira following behind him. Maybe not but I need you, please don't make me beg anymore. Just give me a chance to redeem myself right now that's all I'm asking. Volga stopped and thought quietly to himself then went to his bedroom to find the tweezers. He sat on his bed then looked up at Kira. She seemed genuine this time. Then again how would he know the difference with her? I'm sorry but I have no way of knowing if I could ever trust someone like you. Kira dropped to her knees and grabbed Volga's hands, looking him in the eye and begged, Volga please, you don't understand what it's like to have something be a part of you your whole life, only to have it taken from you for some stupid mistake you made when you were young. Her eyes started to tear up and Volga sighed. She let go of his hands and he handed her the tweezers. Just give me a minute before you begin. He closed his eyes with a look of silent and deep concentration on his face. Second later, the area of skin on his shoulder with the stitches turned from a pale Caucasian color to a light blue. All right that area should be numb enough now, go ahead, Volga said. Kira nodded and then slowly and carefully started pulling on the end of the stitches with the tweezers, Volga didn't even wince. Slowly, she removed them all the while Volga kept to his thoughts. When she was done, he took the tweezers and silk stitches and put them aside then leaned back on his bed. Then he looked to her and said, You want me to remove that band? Fine, but I will only give you one chance to get me to trust you before we reach the tower. If you somehow manage to fail that by the time we get there then I will leave that band on and leave you behind. And if I return to find my home in ruins, I will seek you out, I will find you, and I will make you pay, got it? Kira's face lit up and she wrapped her arms around him, yes, yes. It's a deal. She then let him go and left him alone for a time. He spent the rest of the day enchanting the map to make it invisible to anyone but him. Then he pondered his decision to allow Kira to join him, 
but it wasn't like he had anyone else he could ask yet, he didn't even know where to start. Kira broke through his empty thoughts when she came upstairs to find him and tell him dinner would be done soon. Only after she reminded him that he needed food did he realize he was so hungry. They had rabbits too and finished off the rest of Volga's bread for dinner. While they ate Kira asked, So how does one so young as yourself know such great spells? Volga replied with a question of his own, How does one as beautiful as yourself become a thief? Neither wanted to compromise their story first so they ate in silence for a while after that. But Kira knew from the little time she spent with him Volga was very likely the type of person to remain silent as the grade when confronted with this sort of problem. Before long she gave up the feud and spoke first, I was born an orphan and went without a lot of things for years. Volga kindly stopped eating to look at her as she told her story, though she kept her eyes down at her food. Sometimes that even meant without food. But when my magic started to expose itself around the same time I had puberty I was moved to a small orphan home with three other girls around my age with magic too. We lived in a small home, sharing one room between us four and was apprenticed to an elder magi, Ciela. She was a kind enough old lady but she could only keep one of us on long term and that went to the girl who showed the most promise in magic. And so when my magic developed the way they were, transparency and such, Ciela decided it was not enough for me to become great so I was kicked to the streets. Stealing was just something I did to stay alive back then but the thrill of it all kept me going for bigger prizes than day-to-day -day meals. I also wanted to live a comfortable life so I began stealing better prizes like jewelry, or diamonds, I got so good they nicknamed me Fox. Kira looked up and smiled slyly. Seeing that Volga didn't recognize the name her eyes went out of focus and back into her story she went. I soon enough got picked up by a small crime family of others like me. They hired me to steal some weird items or artifacts all around Dorgal, it was pretty hard but the pay was great. And most of the men in that group, they were just hot. And the sex with some of them was just unbelievable. Some days that's all I did was fuck late into the evening and then do it again the next night. Kira went to continue her detailed love life until she saw the surprised expression on Volga's face, and stopped. Then she moved on to the end of her tale. Anyways one day they gave me this job, something I didn't think was any different than before but this time when I went in to steal my target a force shield sprung up around me and I was trapped. The council caught me, put this band on my wrist and when I returned to my small crime family. They wanted nothing more to do with me, without my magic I was useless to them. Volga gathered his thoughts then said, wow that's quite the tale. When he said nothing more Kira said, All right your turn, give me your tail now. Volga played with his food a little before saying anything, There is not much to tell really. My parents died in the civil war and a friend of theirs dropped me off at the house of my mom's former master. I have lived here my whole life and my master taught me a wide diversity of spells and gave me total access to his library where I could learn whatever spells I wanted. Of course I went for the more destructive or dynamic spells to try and impress some girls. Needless to say that wasn't how to go about it. Volga ended his short tale and continued eating his meal. Feeling Volga's story was a little short-ended Kira said, Okay then let me ask something else, that map it means something a lot more to you than just a valuable piece of knowledge doesn't it? Something, sentimental. Volga pushed his plate away from him, irritated and his appetite lost. My master left it behind for me, this house too. But he was more than just my master he was like my father, he raised me as his own, was always kind to me, but stern when he needed to be. So yes thief the map is very precious to me, this house too. Kira gently pushed her plate away too, feeling guilty she lost her appetite. She let the silence drag out, Volga could see she had another question she wanted to ask but was now reconsidering it. Agitated he said, just ask. The wishes from the tower, what are you seeking from them? Volga seemed to go back to a normal calm state after the question, he then turned his head slowly and closed his eyes, deep in thought. Eventually, he turned back to Kira and asked, If you had a chance to bring someone you love back to you, wouldn't you take it? Kira had no immediate answer for that, in fact she had no answer at all. So Volga got out of his chair and said, We head out tomorrow morning, wash the dishes when you're done here and get some rest. Chapter 17 King Aberon, Chapter 3 Aberon was bordering his limits of control and was ready to go berserk and tear Jeremiah and Ceslo apart with his bare hands. Bethany was enraged too but she managed to keep her composure better and wrapped her hand around Aberon's and squeezed strong yet gently. 
Aberon managed to keep himself in check after that but the furry was evident on his face nonetheless, and so he said, Your avarice is insurmountable, however how do you plan on getting into Evercane to climb the tower and get that wish? No doubt King Alden already sent his troops up there and has a great lead, assuming if what you said is true and all of Grimner had the same dream as us. After all, we both know that without the other's help, neither of us has the power to invade Evercane, and Dorgal made it perfectly clear to you they will, as they always have, stay out of all this. So tell me Jeremiah. What makes things any different now for you than they did five years ago? Jeremiah and Ceslo finished their glasses of wine then stood up, Aberon and Bethany stood with them, glaring them down. It seems I overestimated your intelligence Aberon, Jeremiah said. The tower's arrival itself changed everything, and I don't need to invade Evercane in order to enter those lands or the Devil Tower. With his final words said Jeremiah and his wife boldly turned their backs and left. Aberon was unmoving for a short time waiting until they would be far enough not to hear. He brought his hands up into tight closed fists above his head, he slammed them down on the table with such great force it broke in two from the impact. He bellowed with rage and kicked one half of the table across the room and into the wall. This whole time I knew he was up to something and he was just fucking with us. Aberon yelled. That impudent pudgy fuck he comes to my home and feasts on my food and drinks my wine, then has the nerve to insult me through it all. The roads back home could be dangerous for him with only a dozen guards, Bethany said as the dark nature of her meaning cooed in Aberon's ears. Aberon took some time to cool down before saying anything more, No, I gave him my word. And my honor is worth more to me than his fat head on a pike. At least for the time being. I'm going to go train, I need a good fight to settle my nerves. Jeremiah took his leave not long after the false talks of alliance with Aberon and Bethany. His smug look however transformed into a scowl as he went to retrieve his daughters and found Aberon's second son, Grathel, riding Curano like a horse. He wore that scowl on his face all the way out of the castle and probably for a few good miles down the road too. When Aberon finished beating up his guards in what he called training he heard of the news about Grathel and Curano and confronted his son about it. Raffle had his head hung in shame as he said, I'm sorry father I know you must be disappointed I didn't mean to. Aberon cut him off there, disappointed is an understatement. If Jeremiah or any one of them found out about this if we had an alliance it would have shattered it then and there. At best we woulda have salvaged it by having the two of you marry. Otherwise the damage you would have caused today would be reprehensible. I'm sorry father. Aberon then burst into laughter, sorry? Don't be, that fat bastard of a king had been playing us all along this is nice payback for all that. Bethany will make sure all of Grimner hears that his daughter lost her maidenhood before marriage. Good luck marrying her off to someone worthwhile now you fat fuck Jeremiah. Raffle looked up to see that his father was genuinely in humor about all this and joined him in the ironic laughter. Then Raffle said, I should fuck more noble girls than hey. Maybe one of my younger brothers found their way into Lessel's bed too. The two of them laughed even harder after that. Three weeks passed since King Jeremiah had left Alatern and traveled home. Aberon heard no word from Cantor since then and still had not thought of a solution as to how they would enter Evercane borders. At this point Aberon was ready to start smuggling him and a few men at a time across trade ships until they had a decent force to ascend the tower. Out of ideas and, for fear of running out of time, Aberon began the preparations for the smuggling until the day Sir Toby Lee showed up as an envoy for Evercane, delivering a message directly to Aberon. Sir Toby was a notable knight of Evercane, his appearance was less than average and in person Aberon could see why. Toby was well fit man but had the look of someone 30 years older than himself and some nasty scars on his face and neck, trophies of battle as Aberon called them. Even as a neutral party Aberon respected a knight such as Toby, skilled in battle and hardened to the core, so it was with little consideration at all that he invited him so openly into his castle, under watchful eyes of course. Aberon took Sir Toby to his new, temporary, council room to discuss his visit in private. He offered the knight a mug of ale but Toby declined and Aberon asked, So what brings a renowned knight of Evercane all the way west to my kingdom, and alone at that? Toby raised his left arm and carefully started sliding out a piece of well-folded paper from his slightly loose gauntlet. The wax seal on it was a little damaged from the travel but still unopened. Aberon recognized the seal right away, it was a golden bird, King Alden's seal. A very special letter from my king, Toby said. He did not reveal the contents at all to me and made sure I know that it was imperative that it be delivered to you and you alone. For this reason I was tasked with the delivery of this letter but in a manner so private that it had to be hidden away safely in my gauntlet. 
I am also tasked with sending him whatever answer or message you have given to my king in regards of that letter. I am not to leave here until I have an answer so if you wish it I shall seek refuge at the nearest town and await there until your summons. Abaron stared down Toby trying to find any more info from his face but the knight's look was impassive, he had either had no more to do aside from what he said his reason for being here was, or he was excellent at concealing emotions, probably both. Abaron broke the seal and unfolded the letter, poring over its contents while Toby sat there quietly, unmoving even, like a statue. After reading the letter Abaron glanced up at Toby then back down to the letter, reading its content once more but slower. When he finished the second read Abaron placed the letter down on the table and sat quietly in thought for a short time. Then he called out to his guards and told them, Find Sir Toby Lee a suitable room to stay in and bring him a warm meal. He then turned to Toby and said, You have permission to walk around the castle as you like but only under the escort of my guards. They will also be stationed outside your door. Toby stood up and gave a light bow to Alden and said, Then I shall wait for your message sire. And as the guards escorted him out Abaron said, And go fetch my wife while you guys are at it. Bethany read over the letter from King Alden twice, just as her husband, and then asked, What does this mean exactly? I must confess that I'm not entirely sure, Abaron said. King Alden is not someone I know all too well, still he has been very upfront to me about his intentions in this letter. He said he is willing to let us in with a small battalion, of no more than thirty men to grant us access to ascend the tower as we see fit. Bethany said. But on the conditions that we bring this force to his castle and leave most of the men outside the city, in a neutral state of arms. He was more specific that I go, not us, he wants to speak with me mostly it seems. And the grant of tower entrance is just a show of good faith to us in the negotiations of an alliance and union between our two kingdoms. Abaron said, partially absent in thought. It could be he wants to lure you and some of our best men into a trap and kill you all. Bethany said grimly. After all, he stated he knows that we tried to unite with Cantor, by word from that fat bastard Jeremiah, so that would be opportune motive to write this letter. The timing is suspicious, Abaron agreed. But he already claimed that he had sent some of his own vet's men, and son into the tower to ascend it many months ago. It proves that we were right that Evercane has a serious lead on us for climbing the tower and they might have a shot at obtaining that wish. But I feel King Alden is sincere in his desire to broker an alliance, a true alliance, with us. After all Evercane had very little need of our resources in comparison to our needs of theirs. And even after our invasion attempt he generously kept open a limited trade with us and without absurd rates like 10 pounds of iron for 20 gold coins. I believe he has honest intentions. It could still be a trap, Alden has some wise counselors I'm sure one of them, or all of them, combined could have orchestrated this devious scheme to remove you as a formidable threat. Once more Abaron agreed with Bethany, but still he believed in this opportunity. It's a great risk, but I'm running out of time so I will let the gods decide my fate. Go tell the guards to bring Sir Toby Lee back here, I have made my decision. Sir Toby came to Abaron and patiently awaited his message. Ride out as soon as you can and tell King Alden that I agree to his terms. Abaron said. And in three days time, starting tomorrow, I will set out with my men to enter through the river gate and meet with Alden at the city. Also inform him I shall keep most of my men stationed outside the city but will bring no less than half a dozen of them with me to our meeting. Toby nodded his head then said, Of course sire, I shall leave immediately to pass your message along to my king. Is there anything more before I leave? No sir Lee, you have done well enough and may take your leave as you see fit. Toby bowed lightly and true to his word left that very day, even though dusk was swiftly approaching on him. In the following few days as Abaron made his preparation to leave Torith and Bethany gave him much trouble as they pestered him about letting them join. He told them no and that in his stead they shall rule a Alatern, he also took a private word with them and said, If anything is to happen to me over there because of Alden, then you two have my permission to unleash our full wrath upon them and any who stands in your way. What that meant is that if Alden stabs him in the back they have his permission to avenge him in whatever way they saw fit for his justice. On the morning before Abaron and his troop set out Rathal pulled his father aside to talk with him. What do you want boy, and make it quick? Abaron said. I understand leaving Torith behind, if you fall then he will be the next king, but leaving mother, and the rest of us behind like this, why? Your mother is a great leader and Torith will need her help in leading the kingdom. And your brothers have no place with me on this mission. You took us into battle before how is this any different? Rathal argued back. 
Besides you're not just going to the tower you're meeting with one of our greatest advisories in the history of Alatern, it makes no sense not to bring at least one of your kin along for it. Torith will inherit the kingdom after you by right, but I am your second son and it's my right to be by your side at such matters, whether war or politics. Aberon shook his head, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. No less than you, father if you don't allow me to accompany you then you not only insult me, you dishonor me greatly. There was a long pause of silence between the two of them before Aberon said, Every bit the bullheaded and stubborn man I ever was at your age. You got some of your mother's manipulation in you too boy. So then, that means you will let me join. Aye it does, but you do what I say when I say it. Out there I'm your king and leader before your father and you obey my commands even if you hate them, got it? I will do you proud, my king. After twenty good leagues of travel night was falling and Aberon had decided to make camp on the road. As the most of the men began pitching the tents and unloading supplies small factions of them had been broken off for extra tasks such as leading the horses to the nearest stream or pool of fresh water, or hunting. Aberon and Rathal set out for a small hunt of their own, Vladmore, the captain of the king's guard, urged that he at least join the two on their hunt but Aberon was insistent they go alone, for some extra family time. The two of them were paying very little attention to any noticeable tracks and already knew the chances of catching anything at that hour was slim. But Aberon knew Rathal had something on his mind he wanted to talk about and this gave him a perfect chance for it. So as they walked along, partially careless, Aberon asked, So what's been on your mind this long trip all day? I want you to tell me more about this mission of ours, Rathal said. There is nothing more to tell, we're going to the Evercane capital city where I will meet with King Alden to discuss terms of a union between our kingdom. After that we shall go ascend the tower and prove ourselves to the gods by acquiring that wish at the top. And if this is all an elaborate trap, then I will kill the king and as many others as I can before I fall. Not we. Am I not joining you inside the city? Aberon stopped walking and hesitated before he answered. No you're going to stay back with the main troop outside the city. And if you don't see me return to you within a few hours, or at least send one of my own guard to message you, then you will flee with our troops and hide. From there, with you and our men inside, Torith will rally the rest of our kingdom and you will have a better chance at vengeance in my name. However I don't think for King Alden is such a man to do that sort of thing. He may not be a warrior or a great commander but good men make good kings. If he was as bad as Jeremiah then our invasion would have turned out successful as half the kingdom would have seen us as liberators instead of conquerors. That sounds like a lot of trust and confidence to put into a man you never before met, Rathal said. I trust him to act exactly how I have perceived him, as do I trust for all my enemies that I have gotten to know. Understanding your enemy, and friends for that matter, is how you stay king. Know who you can trust to act a certain way, and move the unpredictable ones away from you. On the rest of the journey to Evercane Aberon, Rathal and all the men just traded war stories they told a hundred times over before around the campfire. There was no more need for serious talk, they knew what to expect, so now out here it was time to enjoy the calm days of travel and company of your allies, for they all knew that once they entered the Evercane borders there would be no more calm days. Even if the alliance was a true prospect, the Devil Tower itself was a little frightening. None of the men dared speak about it so openly with the king or the prince nearby but despite that promise of a wish at the top, the tower spooked them, like nothing ever before or since. When they arrived at the middle bridge Aberon stopped and paused a moment to think back on the last time he was there. It almost seemed like a whole other life now with everything that's happened since then. Still even now he couldn't help but feel as if the gods were against him during that invasion. But all that was in the past and a new day was dawning. He wasted enough time in the past and kicked his horse to continue on. As soon as Aberon's horse crossed the bridge the great ironwood gate began to open outward. And from it came a very pretty young woman with blonde hair pulled tight into a pony, tail and a company of twenty horse mounted troops. She rode up to approach Aberon as he continued alone to meet her. They stopped four yards apart and the young woman inquired, King Aberon I assume. Aberon stared her down before answering, I, and you're here to make sure we don't cause any trouble along the way to the capital, I assume. The young woman grinned and said, I am Commander Lecture Camber, but please call me Lex. And I am here to escort you to the capital city since King Alden doesn't want you getting lost along the way there. Aberon smiled and tapped his horse's sides with his feet and it continued its pace on, Rathal and the men followed soon as they saw his horse continue on. 
Lex rode by Aberon's side at every opportunity, she wanted to keep a close eye on him. They made great distance for the rest of that day. Lex wanted to stop long ago but said nothing to Aberon, she didn't want to seem weak in front of him. The trip to the capital, which should have taken at least five days, took three. The closer Aberon came to the capital the harder he pushed to go faster, he was tired of waiting. When they arrived at the city Aberon said blatantly, I am taking my six kings guard me to meet with Alden. Commander Lex looked back at the small battalion with Aberon then said, Yes I don't think that will be an issue, so long as the rest of your men remain outside the city at a fair distance. The citizens are still a little uneasy about having your men so close to their city. Of course, we told them there is nothing to fear, that you are future allies to welcome. Good to hear, then you don't mind taking your men and riding ahead in the city and giving me a few moments with my own men. Lex said nothing more but Aberon could tell she was adverse to the idea, still she went along with it and led her men into the city through the main gates. When they were far enough Aberon turned back to his men and went to Rathal to speak with him. So far, everything has gone out as promised and I see no signs of an attack, Aberon said. Have the men prep camp about a mile away from the city and if you see no sign of me within the next few hours then flee. You still distrust King Alden even now? Rathal asked. I don't know Alden too well and always have a plan B. I think at first your plan B was legitimate, but now that we have come here and are already been through the most optimal situations for them to attack us. Rathal hesitated before continuing. Now though I think it's paranoia. At this point, even if we do flee, with how exhausted all our men and the horses are, we wouldn't get too far, nor would we put up much of a fight. I think we can afford a little rest. Aberon's face turned chagrined as he turned away and galloped his horse to the city. Rathal sighed but began leading the men back to set up camp, and give them some rest. His father was so upset he didn't hail his guards so Rathal picked them out and told them to follow their king. The six men then raced their horses ahead to chase after Aberon. During the entire ride through the city Aberon kept his eyes sharp and carefully glanced around for any signs of organized movement. The streets were a little crowded but they were filled with common folk and a few knights or city guard mixed in here and there. Perhaps Rathal was right, perhaps he was being paranoid, after all if this was a trap the streets would have been emptied and the gates shut with Aberon and his men surrounded by fifty or more men in full plate armor. Aberon allowed himself to relax only after the horses were stabled and he and his personal guards were in the throne room standing just twelve yards before King Alden. Neither kings met with the other face to face like this and only heard about the other through stories or rumors or general info at all. Alden looked like a good man, and someone worthy of his title as king, though he was a bit older than he expected. After Commander Lex introduced Aberon to him, she stepped aside and Alden spoke, Well here you are indeed. The scouts told me of your hat's full journey here but I must admit I thought them to be exaggerating. Yes less than a fortnight you and your battalion are here, you all must be exhausted after the trip. I would like to conduct our business as soon as possible, meaning no offense, but time is not entirely on my side, Aberon said. I can understand that, however I want you to be in a healthy and open-minded state when we start our early discussions about an alliance. And what better way for that than a good night's rest? Aberon went to refuse or argue more that he didn't need rest but Alden beat him to it and continued, You would be insulting me if you didn't. I have already gotten the rooms made up for you and your men, meals as well. Rest, eat, and tomorrow first thing in the morning I will send for you so we can discuss things. Aberon still wanted to conclude his business here as soon as possible so he could move on the tower and worry about such matters afterwards. But he would get nowhere like this and partnerships were complex, if he continued to refuse Alden he could look like he had no intention of brokering an alliance with him. So with little choice at the time, Aberon agreed but had to rush out of the city to tell Rathal that all was fine. Rathal was a bit presumptuous about it when Aberon came back, but he was relieved all the same. Aberon told him to allow the men rest now and then turned around and returned to the castle to eat and rest. The next morning, early in the hours, Aberon had barley finished his breakfast when Alden's counselor, Lord Tarbeck, had personally come for him. He guided Aberon and his guards to the library where Alden was but only Aberon could proceed inside, his guards would have to wait outside. They gave some trouble about it but Aberon commanded them to settle down and remain watch outside the doors, he took his sword with him. At the center of the great library sat King Alden, alone with a book and two goblets of water. Alden could hear his heavy footsteps approaching from far away in the silence of that empty library but waited until he approached to ask, Are you a literary man, Aberon? Aberon took a seat across from him and sniffed at his water before drinking from it. I'm not one for reading no, Aberon said. But I can't say I'm surprised you're a heavy reader, King Alden. 
Alden smiled and closed his book. With just the two of us here you can call me Alden, no need for formalities in here. Alden set the book on the table drank from his goblet and continued. I understand your eagerness to go to the tower and ascend it. My spies tell me you believe that the wish at the top is a challenge from the gods to reach up there and grab it. Perhaps that's exactly what it is too. Anyways I know you're a man relentless to achieve his goals so I would like to just get the basics out of our alliance today, and when you return from the tower, hopefully we can have a series of long discussions about the alliance between our kingdoms, and discuss things in more detail. Aberon relaxed in his chair and said, You want to know what we can offer your kingdom, and what it requires from you in return. Not as blunt as that but more or less in that sense yes, Alden said. What I really want is to increase our trade system and in times of war or crisis, additional military troops. You're a very intelligent man, especially when it comes to warfare, I too like to think I'm intelligent, but not specialized in war. But the simple fact remains that my kingdom cannot close itself off forever if it wants to remain independent and strong. Part of the reason I kept our trade system open between our two kingdoms after your invasion attempt is because you offer the best metals, and have an abundance of mithril. We have gold, silver, copper, food, and great lands for farming, hell even plenty of wood, what we lack most is good metal, which your kingdom provides in trades. Alden could see the irritation growing on Aberon's face so he moved past the details, to get to the point our two kingdoms need each other more than either of us may care to admit or realize. I know times in your kingdom have been hard for a while after your failed invasion, and without our trade system you would have lost many people over the winter. And I'm ashamed to admit without your good metal we would have been broken at times of war. The problem that both our kingdoms face in the future is the constant underestimated kingdom of Cantor. Alone, they are not too excessively powerful nor a formidable foe. But if they team up with another kingdom they could be a serious threat to whomever they turn their sights on. Dorgal I have no doubts will remain a neutral party but if you were able to succeed in negotiations with an alliance with Cantor then the might of your two kingdoms would have brought us down. Aberon's expression went from intrigued to wary for an instant, wondering how many spies King Alden had back in a later. Yes well Cantor's king, Jeremiah, is a more a fool than I realized and decided to insult and challenge me rather than work with me. Aberon said. That being said, why not team up with Cantor to come invade Aladern and take our resources for yourself? Alden thought about it briefly then asked, Do you think that Fat Tomato of a man would be a good ally? Aberon grinned a little then started to laugh, Alden couldn't help but join him. Their laughter echoed through the empty library and as they settled down Aberon said, He is like a tomato isn't he? When the two calmed down from their laughing Alden returned to a more serious mood and said, Truth be told I cannot see Cantor being a good ally, in the near or distant future. And they don't need either of us to survive, they simply need a better king who won't steal all his people's money in excess tax rates. As I said our kingdoms always worked better when in unison, I think it's time that instead of us hoarding our treasures, and you attempting to steal them, that we start working together. I want our kingdoms to ally for generations to come. We can both prosper greatly from it. I allowed you and your limited troops and so that you may ascend the tower as you please, as a form of good faith towards this alliance. And here you are, my agreement honored. Now then let us get down to brass tacks, you know what my kingdom needs from you, what do you need from us? Aberon thought it over in silence for some time then said, We need food, meats, vegetables, fruits, all that sort of stuff which is tedious to acquire in our lands. And we need gold, and silver, copper we have plenty of. Yes you do sometimes trade us in with copper, you seem fine on linen and silk, but what about leather? Alden asked. Aberon nodded, I suppose we could do with more leather, though it's not of high priority for us. Alden and Aberon then drank from their goblets and then Alden asked, and what about militia? I am sure that both our kingdoms can provide our own horses for our troops, but fighting troops is the real, complication at times. If my people are under siege and we call to you for aid, will you answer? Keep in mind it could be long past mine and yours lifetimes but would your people still aid us even then? Aberon rubbed his chin, it was naked as he had a good shave that morning before breakfast. I can't see the future, but whatever agreement we make in the future I can assure you my family will uphold it for so long as it remains in effect. Aberon said. But now I want to know about you, if a Aladern calls for your aid will you bring it? Alden glanced away briefly but then turned back to Aberon and said, I don't know about the future but if at the very least we cannot give military support outside our borders then we can offer sanctuary within them for your people, at times of most dire crisis or critical warfare of course. The two were silent and thought for a time after that until Aberon spoke up, I think you're right. All of this is something that we need to discuss in many meetings over time and with our counselors present. Aberon then rose from his seat and Alden rose with him. 
but I do believe that an alliance would be in both our kingdom's best interests. Alden smiled, Aberon grinned, and the two men shook hands on their mutual agreement for an alliance. Come visit after you return from the tower, I'm eager to hear how your travels inside were, Alden said. Aberon nodded, oh it shall be an interesting journey I'm sure. He then turned and began to walk away but stopped suddenly, remembering something. He turned back to Alden and said, Before King Jeremiah left Aladern he told me he doesn't need to invade in order to gain entry into your kingdom. I don't know what he meant by that and he said nothing more, but he seems very, very certain about it. He also said the tower and the dream changed everything, so he might not be full of shit, at least not about that. And why are you telling me this exactly? Alden asked suspiciously. As a show of good favor for this alliance, Aberon replied. You're doing the same for me and this is the least I can do for you to show I mean for more. Plus, if you manage to foil whatever scheme he's got I'm sure that will be funny to hear. With that Aberon left, he stayed the rest of the day and night in the castle but the next morning he and his men were off to the tower. Chapter 18 Thrain and Company, Chapter 6 Everyone was on full alert the second time they went up to that rocky floor, weapons drawn, steps shallow and prepared. Though they didn't find any demons right away, nor were there any within sight, they kept vigilant and prepared. When they felt safe enough Thrain turned towards Lessa and Adeline and said in a quiet tone, All right Adeline your apprentice is up, we will safeguard this area while she scouts ahead. Adeline whispered something in Lessa's ear and the strange girl stripped off all her clothing, everyone turned away out of courtesy. They didn't see her pale skin begin to change color and blend in with the rocks around, they didn't watch as she slowly appeared to fade into thin air. Lessa moved in complete silence with her camouflage and only Adeline knew when she was actually gone. She told everyone they could relax a little more now, and that Lessa would be gone a while, searching out the best path for them to take. At first their wait was filled with anticipation, but eventually that got too boring and their minds started to dull. Lessa eventually returned and went straight to Adeline to communicate through her. The strange young girl seemed to communicate almost like an animal using body motion and a mix of grunts and moans to speak to Adeline. Only the ranger could understand her so well, but even she seemed to struggle with it at times. When she finished Adeline brushed aside the girl's mossy green hair and kissed her on the forehead whispering, Oh you are a wonderful gem aren't you? Lessa smiled at her affection. Adeline turned to the rest of the group now and said, All right she found us a path leading to the next stairs and it's clear but there are a couple problems, I think. You think? Vera asked concerned about her last statement. Well it's a little hard for even me to understand Lessa, Adeline countered. Anyways the problem, as I understand it, is that the path to the stairs is a long hike up some mountains of some sort. The hike isn't a problem it sounds straightforward, the problem is that once you start going up you can be spotted by the countless demons below and they can probably rush up the mountain faster than us, so we will just need to move carefully up there. And the other problem? Thrain asked. The other problem is that those demons block the main path to the mountains before the stairs, but there is another more indirect path. This path has some complications though, first is there is a dark tunnel before it that stretches for about an hour's walk, however we would be completely blind through that tunnel. And if a demon is in there then we will have a serious problem dealing with it. And the other complication is even outside that tunnel there are numerous demons around the area leading to that mountain path. Now Lessa said she saw them moving further and further away from the tunnel and the mountain path but we have no idea their behavior patterns, they could cycle back just as we're emerging from the tunnel. Thrain thought this over to himself then looked around the group. He turned back to Adeline and asked, And these are the only paths? Yes, I'm afraid so. Thrain turned his gaze onto Lessa and asked, She can go invisible, correct? Environmental camouflage, but for extensive purposes, yes invisibility, Adeline said. Whatever. If it comes to it that we go through that tunnel and there are numerous demons around that have not yet spotted us, could she distract them and lure them away from us while we climb the mountain? And then use her camouflage to sneak away from them and return to us? Angered by the plan Garen jumped into the conversation and said, Oh yes that's even better plan than the first one you had. Now we're going to use the child as a decoy so we may escape, and pray that she makes it back to us. That's enough Garen. Thrain commanded. Garen didn't stop though, he just applauded sarcastically and continued, Well I guess we know how you managed to keep your title as the Lord Commander, sacrificing children so you and the other highborn may live in peace. Thrain heard enough at that point and went over to his squire and punched him across the face so hard he flew to the ground. 
Garen slowly started to get up. Then as Thrain went to say something, he rose to his feet with a swift and powerful uppercut that launched Thrain onto his back. Garen spit the blood out of his mouth and turned sideways with his fists held up in front of him, prepared for a fight. Thrain rose to his feet and rushed at Garen until Rugal jumped between them. Thrain stopped and said, Get out of my way! He then started to move around Rugal before he could even respond, but Rugal caught his arm and said in a commanding tone, By the order of your prince I command you to stand down, both of you. Thrain shrugged his arm free and let out a breath of heated air but he stepped back and relaxed a little. Garen lowered his fists but kept his glare fixated at Thrain. We're still going with my plan, Thrain said. And if either of you don't like it then you can both turn around and leave this tower. Or continue on your own, because it won't be with this group anymore. Thrain turned back to Lessa and Adelin and asked Adelin, can she do this or not? Adelin frowned but looked down to Lessa who nodded in confirmation. Yes she can, Adeline said a little reluctant, since she too didn't fully like the plan either. Good then let's head out now, Thrain said moving forward. Lessa took the lead and the others started to follow until Iris spoke up reminding Lessa that she left her cloths behind. She looked back at them then went to continue until Adeline told her to put them back on, she didn't seem to care at all that she was stark naked, probably preferred it. A bit annoyed she did so and then went back into the lead of the group. Garen was forced to walk in the back of the group as they continued on. Making their way to the dark tunnel was easy, as they encountered no demons along the way. But when they arrived at the tunnel the complications arose yet again. Thrain thought that Iris and Vera could just illuminate the tunnel far enough ahead of them as they went, so that if they encountered any demons in there they would be able to see. But when the two magisters tried to light up anything inside the tunnel it was to no avail, their lights, no matter how bright they shined, were swallowed up by the infinite peering darkness in the tunnel. Thrain groaned in irritation then said, All right everyone keep your weapons drawn while we're in there and lock hands with your left hand. We will hug the left wall and move forward. And Kurth you will take the lead in there, if there is a demon inside you have the best chance of surviving a sudden encounter. And as long as the tunnel doesn't connect to more paths we will be fine. Adeline conveyed the message to Lessa then everyone lined up, locked hands, and moved forward into the dark tunnel. Walking in pitch black like that was disorienting but they had some practice. Still, going in through this dark tunnel knowing that with your next step you could bump into a demon from someone's greatest nightmare was rather unnerving. The walk slow but not at a crippling pace through the tunnel. It bent here and there, but seemed rather straightforward for the most part. The ground inside was flat and leveled, and no one seemed to trip on any hidden rocks on their path. The light at the end of the tunnel gave them relief, and as they continued on at a faster pace they could see outside of it. Before they made it out though one of the shark-headed demons walked by the end of the tunnel, everyone froze in place and remained silent. It turned and looked into the tunnel, staring into the darkness, for a time, until I got bored and walked away. Everyone let out their breath they were holding in and delayed a good several minutes before leaving the tunnel. Outside, and off into the distance, was the wide path of grey rock ascending up jagged spikes which made out the mountain. Beyond the path was a horde of demons roaming away from it at a casual pace, any minute they could turn around and walk back but this was the best chance the group may get. All right guys we may never get a chance like this again, Thrain said with a quiet voice. So we head for that path fast as we can, and quiet as we can, if you have to move slower to keep silent then do so. The group nodded in silence and Thrain took off at a good running pace, despite his mithril plate armor he moved in silence and grace. Everyone except Garen was making good pacing towards the path, even the large mountain mankirth himself displayed he could move in silence when he wanted. Though Garen, Rugal and Thrain all wore the same type of plate armor on Garen struggled with silent movement when going fast, even trying to tiptoe. He managed to keep going without making too much noise but he was far behind the group, and as they started climbing the path without him he couldn't even shout for them to slow down. He kept going though despite all this and didn't dare to look back to see if any of the demons had turned around and might have spotted him. The group started to slow down to a fast walking pace when they made it onto the path, Garen caught up to them then. Steadily, the path elevated higher and higher but it appeared to keep at a level to where you could continue walking up. Adeline looked behind her and saw that no demons had yet come towards the path, they were safe for now. She spoke up saying, All right, we should find a flat level on this path at the top which curves around to a blind bend where the stairs will be. This is a straight walk, we just need to get high enough so then it won't matter if those demons see us. By the time we reach the stairs and ascend them they will still be climbing. Well let's just hope we make it that far at all, look. Vera said pointing down to the landscape where a massive horde of the weird demons were wandering around the rocky landscape below. 
everyone dared to look, they picked up their pace after that. Nearing the top of the path, all the anxiety everyone had been building up, that they would be spotted by just one demon and slaughtered by a horde rushing at them, gradually faded away. They were in the safe stretch now. Or so they assumed until reaching the top. On the flat area, just before the blind bend, stood one of the shark-headed demons, twice the size of the other ones. Its color matched the terrain almost perfectly that it was near invisible at first glance until staring directly at it. The demon seemed alone, which was good, but fighting it with all of them in that area where only about half of them could fight without worry of falling off the edge, that was another problem altogether. Kurth was the first to react, grabbing his double-sided great axe and rushing forward. Stay back, I will handle this, he said. Crimson red veins glowing through his skin as he charged at the demon. Rugal and Garen went to back him up but Thrain thrust his arms out to block them saying, Hold off a minute, I want to see this. The two were agitated by Thrain for this but did as he said, for now. As Kurth closed in on the demon it stretched its right arm out and slashed at him. He blocked with his axe. The two were in equal strength, but as they struggled for power the demon raised its left arm up above it and brought it down aimed at Kurth's head. Kurth pulled away from the power struggle at the last moment, twisting around and ducking under its right arm. He swiftly raised his axe up and hacked the demon's arm off with one clean swing. The demon shrieked in pain and rage but Kurth didn't stop there, he half stepped back and spun around with another clean swing, taking off the demon's leg. It fell to its side helpless as Kurth then drove his axe into the weak spot on the demon's back. Everyone stared at him astonished as the crimson red veins, now glowing through every part of his skin including his face, slowly faded away. He took in some deep breaths and wiped the great accumulation of sweat from his brows. Seeing the look on everyone's face he just smiled at them and strapped his axe onto his back again. Good old Kurth be holding back on us? Rugal asked. I, use an old trick I picked up some years ago, I don't like using it though. Why not that was amazing? Irears said highly impressed by him. Cause unlike them, magic bursts drain be using this doesn't just drain your energy, it drains your lifespan too. I only be using it in most dire times such as this. More like showing off, Rugal teased. No Kurth is right, Adelin said. That fight would have taken too long, even with all of us, there's more monsters on the way already, we need to move now. No one knew if the demons would chase them up the stairs or not, they didn't seem to chase them down the previous floor, but Garen, Iris, and Rugal ascended the stairs backwards to keep an eye out if the demons did come up. The stairs spiraled upwards and had mossy covered walls and steps among them. On the next floor they found it was a swamp area with shallow murky water and random patches of land where the dark fruit trees grew in the center. They made for the closest patch of land and rested there, while keeping an eye on the stairs just in case. Iris and Adeline went around the tree plucking the fruit from the tree and passing it out to everyone. Kurth devoured his fruit right away then put his back against the tree and said, I'm gonna rest now, you watch over me, eh? He closed his eyes and was asleep in seconds. Thrain went around to the other side of the tree away from everyone to eat, since he wasn't on the best of terms with them right now, Garen most of all. He saw Lessa on the other side as well, she was by the shore playing with the water. Thrain finally stated to see her the way Garen seemed to see her now, like a young child. He watched as Lessa stopped splashing the waters at the shore then walked into it, not going very far though. She stopped at one spot and waited quietly and unmoving, her eyes fixated on the murky waters beneath. Thrain noticed that the calm waters started to shift ever slightly now that Lessa was not moving through it. He saw small ripples moving just beneath the surface, as if some small fish were swimming around in there. He kept his focus on the moving ripples in the water but when they started to veer away from Lessa he allowed himself to continue relaxing. Then without warning Lessa pounced at one of the ripples, in an instant her arms transformed into that of a bear. Thrain's eyes grew wide at that sudden transformation. Adeline had told him she could do it, but seeing it for real is way different than hearing it. Moments later Lessa pulled out from the murky waters, with her bare arms, a small red and pink eel-like creature. She smiled playfully, revealing a sharp row of fangs that had replaced her teeth, and carried the squirming creature onto land. She brought it to Adeline who stared at her wide-eyed when she saw what she was holding. After some time of their unusual ways of communication, Adeline and Lessa approached Vera with the creature. Vera shrieked and said, You get that thing away from me! Adeline put her hands on her hips and asked, Seriously? That little thing freaks you out the most. It's all slimy and icky, Vera responded shying away from the creature. 
Adeline shook her head in annoyance and said, Well get past it quick, because Lessa wants you to test the thing and see if it's safe for her to consume. Vera turned her head and started to puke at the thought of Lessa eating that thing. You're pathetic, Adeline said. She then took Lessa and moved on to Iris to see if she could test it. Iris looked just as repulsed as Vera but kept her composure as Adeline asked of her the same thing. Iris made a weird face at the thought of Lessa biting into that thing to eat but she didn't barf. I'm sorry, but even if I wanted to test that, thing, I don't have the knowledge or skills for an assured yes or no. I mean I knew enough to help Vera confirm the fruit was safe to eat but that was something far easier, living creatures over plants is way out of my depth. Besides even if it was edible for her, it would at least need to be cooked properly and neither I nor Vera would want to sit there roasting that thing for hours with our magic. She looked into Lessa's eyes and said, I'm sorry dear, but you're going to have to stick with these fruits like the rest of us. Saddened, Lessa turned away and walked to the waters. Should we be concerned about those things being in the water? Rugal asked watching Lessa toss it back in. No I was watching her play in the water, it looked like the creatures were in fact avoiding her, so I am sure they are very anti-aggressive. Besides the one she had in her hand never twisted to bite her, from what I could see at least. Most everyone was asleep already by the time Kurth had woken up. Save for Thrain who was sitting next to him, relaxing his back against the tree as well. Noticing that Kurth was awake Thrain started a quiet conversation. You know my father taught me the magical bursts that I used to increase my physical capabilities when I was twelve. I mastered them pretty well within the two years just before the Aladern invasion. I asked him if it was a trade family secret, he told me it was something far less than that. He said it was a cheap imitation of another more powerful ability that he learned from a mysterious warrior in Dorgal. He said despite all his years of practice and study he was only able to copy the ability in the way that I use it now. Thrain lingered on his tail to look Kurth directly in the eyes then continued. That ability, as my father described, caused the veins in the user to glow red and appear through the skin. Exactly like what happened to you when you fought that enormous demon on the floor below. So how did you learn that ability exactly? Kurth just casually nodded his head to the side and said, Eh, one day it just come to me, when fighting my toughest enemy yet. I, it be a monster just like them they're demons we fought before, though stronger than even they. I began to use it much after that, despite the exhaustion to me afterwards. I be showing off with it in me youth, but when I be flexing to my pretty wizard friend with it, she told me never to be using it unless in most dire situation. I asks her why, she says that it be taking a huge toll on my overall health. Says it will cut down on my life by years at a time. She say, I keep using it like the ways I do I won't live to see a few more springs. I never know her to be wrong, so I did as she said and start holding back on it, more and more until I no longer be needing it. Except them rare and special cases. Thrain looked down at his feet a little disappointed by the tale. So I guess you wouldn't be able to teach me how to preform it? He asked. If it can be taught, then it wouldn't be the likes of someone as me. Kurth responded. He then rose to his feet and stretched his legs. I be hungry now, I think you get in some rest while I take over the watch duty. Thrain stood up as well and said, That's a generous offer, but it's Garen's turn to be on lookout while I rest. I not be having, Kurth protested. You give that lad some rest and get some yourself. I won't be sleeping no time soon again. Thrain was in no mood to argue and said, All right have it your way, but be prepared for when we all wake up and eat then it's time we to get moving again. Who knows what keeps those demons from ascending the stairs after us up here, but if it stops I'd rather we be further ahead when they come. Chapter 19 The Frigid Prince, Chapter 3 Stepping through the dark veil and coming into the tower in Agil was riddled with disappointment. The base floor was an empty round room of light grey color. Going further into the empty floor a voice blatantly spoke out behind him. Well this was disappointing. I sure thought there would be more in here. Inagil turned around to see a small group of young men around his age, perhaps a little older, standing just by the tower entrance looking around the room. Upon seeing Inagil the three of them smiled at him and waved. The one in the lead called to out to him, Hello there my frosty haired friend. Judging by his voice Inagil realized he must have been the one to shout out his disappointment in the tower's first floor. Inagil glared at them, a little annoyed by their presence, and turned away. Not five steps further was Inagil stopped by a voice right next to him asking, Mind if I ask you a question? Startled by the sudden presence right next to him Inagil jumped back. He saw one of the young men from the group standing right next to where he was before he jumped. 
the young man turned to face him and scratched at his short brown hair. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you, he said. Inagil turned sideways defensively and glanced back to see the others casually walking towards them. How the hell did you get to me so fast? Inagil demanded to know. You were all the way back by the entrance when I turned away from you. I teleported. The young man said with a big grin on his face. My name is Yadriel, what's yours? He asked offering out his hand. Inagil didn't take it but he relaxed a little more, still keeping his guard up though, and said, Mine is Inagil. Yadriel withdrew his hand but kept his grin. Yadriel can be a bit eccentric at first, one of them said from behind Inagil. He turned around to see the others now just behind him. Yadriel walked over to join his friends and the one taking lead said, My name is Matthias. The bald one is Igor, and the pink-haired fool is Curtis. And you already met Yadriel. And together we are, the mighty mystic four, Curtis said pumping his fist into the air. Igor hit his face with his palm and said, I told you not to call us that. It makes us sound like morons. Look what do you guys want from me? Inagil asked before they started arguing amongst each other. Well we saw you all by your lonesome self and thought you might want to join us in climbing the tower. Matthias said. Inagil scoffed and said, You didn't think this through very well then. For all you know I could be a murderer and might slit your throats the moment you lay down to rest. For you, it'd probably be easier to just freeze us all now. What are you getting at? Come on, we saw your stairs of ice climbing all the way up to the top of the Evercane wall. That is some insane magic, you might be even stronger than the council. Inagil shook his head annoyed and asked, Why are you guys even climbing the tower anyways? Matthias shrugged and said, Same reason as you we presume, to get that at the top. Inagil took a step back, preparing his magic for a moment's notice. How did you know about that wish? Duh, all of Grimner knows about the wish, it came in that weird dream on the full moon. Did you really think you were the only one? Inagil looked down at his feet feeling stupid, how could he believe the gods would suddenly smile down upon him now? I did actually, until now. He said, relaxing his guard and looking back up. Matthias smiled sympathetically for him and said, Yeah we thought the same thing for a little while at least. But no doubt there are others who have already started climbing, so are you with us or not? We could use someone with your power on our team. You may need me but I don't need you, remember only one can have the wish. Inagil turned away from them and started jogging ahead. He stopped when all of them suddenly appeared much further ahead of him. Matthias turned around and called back to him, Then I guess we will see you at the top. Farewell. The group then started jogging forward, Inagil ran after them. When Inagil caught up to them they were all standing before the multiple set of stairs leading up. Matthias saw him and smiled, Changed your mind about joining us already? He asked. No, Inagil answered. But I'm starting to reconsider letting you guys live, with those abilities of yours you might make it to the top long before me. I don't believe you would kill us for something so stupid. And I think you know that we're not some bloodthirsty cutthroats either, annoying perhaps but not murders. Why are you so keen on me joining you guys? We don't know each other and this place is dangerous. Exactly why we want someone as powerful as you on our side. Come on we saw you at the Evercane wall and would have asked you sooner but couldn't find you. Besides no one truly wants to be alone, how about joining us up the stairs and through the next floor at least. If you still don't want our company then I promise we won't bother you no more. Inagil looked over all their faces carefully. They were a lively bunch but sincere as far as he could tell. All right, he said, I'll let you guys join me. But I take lead and if you even consider stabbing me in the back you won't live long enough to regret it. Matthias smirked and gestured towards the stairs, by all means lead the way. Coming out onto the next floor the others looked around with a sense of wonder. Inagil looked around for signs of danger but found none. Well this ground is spongy, Curtis said as he walked into the floor. Yeah and check out those weird fruit trees, Igor said. They might be edible. Really? They look pretty tasty in fact. Curtis walked over to the nearest dark tree and plucked one of the fruits. Inagil watched with great interest as the pink-haired guy, Curtis, ate the dark fruit. It's pretty good guys try some. Curtis said finishing off his fruit. As the others went and plucked some fruit of their own Inagil asked, Didn't you guys bring your own food rations? 
We ate the last of it before coming in here, Matthias said. Did you? Inagil looked away, that was a no. Matthias smirked and tossed him the fruit. Inagil caught it and Matthias said, well then eat up. He then plucked another fruit and began eating it. Cautiously Inagil sniffed at his fruit and tore a chunk out of it then licked it. It didn't taste poisonous, in fact it tasted rather good. He ate the chunk he tore off and when he didn't feel sick right away, and because he realized he was starving, he devoured the dark fruit. When all of them finished eating Matthias said, Well I'm kind of exhausted now that I got some food in my stomach, anyone else? The others answered with a yes. I'm feeling tired too, Inagil said, but we should get ourselves some distance from the stairs leading up so we're not too close if others come up them. It would be troubling to be asleep and be attacked. Good plan, but where should we go? These trees don't seem to offer much cover in general, or would we be safe to rest? Inagil looked around and thought about the answer. When his eyes returned to the stairs he figured out where to go. We'll follow the wall along for a while then move forward and stop. Most likely people ascending the stairs will just move straight forward and wouldn't consider going along the wall. The group already started moving before Inagil even finished his explanation. They wanted to stop numerous times but Inagil kept going until the stairs were barely within his sights. From there they moved forward away from the wall for about 10 minutes and then made camp. All right I'll take first watch, Inagil said looking around for any other presence. Then Matthias you will swap in after me. They had all rested their heads down on whatever makeshift pillows they had created to rest when Inagil turned back to them. He sighed irritated and sat down resting his back against one of trees, pretending to watch out vigilantly for anyone else but really he kept his eyes on them, still untrusting. Before long Inagil caught onto everyone's breathing pattern, they were all indeed asleep. If he wanted to get ahead of them now would be his best chance. Just move out silently and keep moving until he was too exhausted to go further, that should get him far enough ahead of them. Still he sat there, watching over them. If someone came by they could slit their throats and remove the competition with little effort at all. But why did he care, they weren't his problem. They all just met that day he shouldn't care about them, but in that short time he felt them grow on him, enough to stick around for the time being at least. When the time came for him to wake Matthias up Inagil managed to get him up but he couldn't stay awake for long and Inagil was forced to keep watching despite how tired he was. He played around with his ice magic to pass the time. Crafting a lance of pure ice and carefully molding it into a fine weapon. It took him some time just to get the balance right and even then he had to keep recrafting it until it fit his style perfectly. After that he forged in some grooves around the spear to fit his grasp so it had grip on it. Not too long after he finished crafting his lance and practicing with it, to see if it was fit for him, did the others start to wake up. He stood there silently watching them as they got up and stretched out. When all of them were up and active, he made his move. Dashing for them all, he thrust his ice lance at them one by one and before they could react, he had made either a small cut on their necks or a jab on their chest where the heart was. The attacks weren't lethal but they certainly hurt a lot. Matthias came at Inagil now, what the hell are you doing? He demanded to know. In response Inagil swiftly turned around and thrust the lance tip at Matthias' throat, stopping with the tip gently poking against his windpipe. Dead, Inagil said, all of you are dead. And you're to blame. He kept his ferocious icy stare of Matthias for a moment longer before pulling his lance back and relaxing. He spoke addressing the others over Matthias, all of you could have been dead by now because he, Inagil pointed over to Matthias, was asleep while on watch duty. We won't always be so alone on these floors and I don't intend to keep losing sleep over watching out for you guys. Inagil then stormed off ahead of them. They followed behind him at a much slower pace. That was rather unnecessary, Yadriel said. No. No he is right, Matthias said. Things are different here and if we're not much more careful then we will all end up dead. Next time I won't mess up while on watch duty. Now let's go catch up to an Inagil. Wow those stairs were a pain in the ass to find, Yadriel said. Not really, they were pretty much a straight shot across from the ones leading up to that floor. Igor said. Okay yeah, but still with how large these floors are even that is annoying. You have a point, perhaps we should split up into smaller groups to search out the next stairs leading up. Maybe, I guess if there is no signs of others around then we could, Matthias said. 
Inagil, what do you think? Inagil stopped to take a look around them. This floor likes almost exactly the same as the one below it, he said. But the layout is a little different, the trees are spaced further apart and in different patterns, so it's not the same. Still, we could easily walk in circles around here. He stopped talking and walked over to one of the trees and started carving into it with his ice lance. He carved in a simple vertical line which frosted over from his weapon and stood out like a beacon among the other trees. There, we will mark our way in the trees. They all stood there staring at him for a moment until Matthias finally said, That's a great idea, but we don't have any weapons. Also, we can't just make our own like you did. You can't just carve something into the trees with your magic. Matthias chuckled awkwardly and said, Well the thing is, I don't know how else to put this but we kind of suck at magic, except in special cases. And Curtis doesn't have much magic in him at all, he's more of an alchemist. Inagil sighed, feeling greatly annoyed and asked, Can you do anything practical in this place besides run away? And Curtis couldn't you have mixed up some sort of battle potions with your alchemy before coming here? Their silence and way they turned their heads away from Inagil was a solid answer of no. Can you even fight? No wait don't answer that, I already know it's a no. You can't fight, your magic is almost useless here, and you didn't even bring weapons. Why did you bother coming to the tower? Well we thought that. You thought, Inagil said derisively. Clearly, you didn't think because if you did you would realize that this place will be swarming with strong warriors. Strong magisters, knights, anyone strong or bold enough to try their luck to climb. And since only one can get their wish, everyone else in this place is competition and must be eliminated, it turns into survival of the fittest. You're not fit, you're certainly not intelligent, and the only thing you can do is run away. So how do you expect to get that wish at all with your talents, and for that matter which one of you would be getting it? We know we're not some amazing fighters, or some super powerful magister, Matthias said, his tone and attitude more fierce and serious than Inagil saw in him before. We don't have any real chance of getting to the top of this tower and all of us understand this. But that doesn't mean we can't gather information about this place and sell it to others traveling up it. I don't know where you come from or what life you lived but all of us here were raised in the same orphanage without a copper to our names and no traditional schooling or trade, or craft. Most everything we know now we learned ourselves but this is the end of our rope. We can't become apprenticed to a good craftsman or magister without money. And we can't earn money without going to school, and we can't go to school without money. So how do we get this money we so desperately need? By selling information and even maps about the tower to people willing to climb it. We can make some good money that way and hopefully return home before the next winter cycle starts. Inagil ran a hand through his frosty blue hair and said, All right, then we'll split up into three groups and each go separate ways. I'll go on my own and you guys decide who goes with whom. He paused to build up a pillar of ice in front of him. Make sure to keep an eye and ear out for others and we'll meet back up at this pillar when we either find something or feel our stomachs getting empty. He didn't wait for them to answer before moving on to look for the stairs. The others were still a little flustered with his attitude from earlier but they went along with his plan regardless. They climbed up several floors without meeting any others and almost wondered if they ever would. Man this place is driving me insane, we've been walking through the same forest like floors for weeks now, Yadriel said frustrated. Are we even making progress? I mean it feels like we're just cycling around the same floors even though we find the stairs and climb. We're certainly making progress, but these floors are rather peculiar, Igor said. Man how do you even know we're making progress? Because I have been mapping out the floors each time we rest and drawing in the path to the next stairs once we find it. They make look the same but according to my maps they're all different in some way or another. Now that I think about it though these floors, the ones with the dark fruit trees, look naturally grown. I mean the spongy floor and the arbitrary placements of all the trees, it's all so perfectly random. I don't believe these floors were directly built or designed by anyone or anything except for the forces of nature. Like this place just grew naturally. Yeah, and what do you know about architecture and construction? Inagil asked Snarky. A lot actually, I studied it for a while. Wanted to be an architect when I was older but I lacked credibility to be hired on by the Council of Dorgal, as well as the fund to pay for the schooling to get it. So I outsourced myself for cheap but excellent repairs on homes and buildings while we wandered around towns and cities. Igor, here is the reason we didn't starve some winters, and were sheltered, Matthias said. 
I took on whatever odd jobs I could find but because I wasn't a specialist my work was usually cleaning out the sewers. The work was terrible but the pay was decent enough to keep us going and even help us save a few coppers here and there for schooling down the road. Sorry, I didn't know you guys had such hard lives, Inagil said sympathetically. Matthias shrugged and said, Don't worry about it. Brighter days lay ahead of. He was stopped suddenly when Inagil covered his mouth with his hand to shut him up. Looking off to the distance Inagil whispered, Shush, there is someone out there. They were all silent and watching out in the same direction as Inagil. They saw nothing but soon heard the very faint sound of whistling out there. Before long a savage-looking man, with numerous scars on his face and full-plate armor, with a bear design embossed over the breastplate, walked out into their sights. As he continued on whistling his tune Inagil stared at him, a mixed array of emotions on his face. I don't believe it, Inagil said. Inagil what is it? Who is that man? Matthias asked. He's Boris of Jailer, a noble knight of Aladern. But... It's impossible. What's impossible? Boris died during the invasion of Evercane by Aladern, at the Battle of the Bridges. Chapter 20 Thrain and Company, Chapter 7 Thrain, Thrain honey wake up. Come look at your newborn daughter. Thrain rolled in his bed and mumbled lightly, Jezebel. Yes dear it's me. Now get up and say hello to our daughter Emily. Jezebel said. Coming to his senses Thrain snapped his eyes open and shot up. He looked around him, he was back in his room inside the morning keep, his beautiful wife in bed next to him cradling a young baby, his baby. How did I get back here? This is a dream right? It has to be. Jezebel only smiled at him and said, just because it's a dream doesn't mean it isn't real. Do you want to hold her? She offered out the baby to him. Hesitant he took her in his arms and looked upon her sleeping face. Her beautiful green eyes opened up to him and she smiled. Thrain shed a tear of joy and whispered quietly, My little girl, she's healthy and beautiful. Jezebel leaned her head against his shoulder, smiling as Thrain played with their daughter's little hands. You should leave that tower dear, leave it and come be with us in the real world. I can't, I have to stop this tower, for the kingdom, for us. We can still leave before it's too late, go to somewhere else where we can be together for the rest of our lives. You have given enough to this kingdom. Do you want to abandon your family like your father did, in service to the kingdom? Evercane is unworthy of you and all you have done for it. Abandon that foolish quest and come be with us. Thrain shook his head slowly. I don't understand why are you saying these things. Because if you don't leave the tower now, you will never see us again. The dream world around him instantly faded away and Thrain woke up back inside the tower, in the swamp floor. He looked around to see everyone, but Kurth who was on watch duty, sleeping. Dredging through the swamp floor they went from patch of land to patch of land as much as possible, to avoid the murky waters, in search of the next stairs. It took them, what the measured is, a week to find the next stairs on that floor. Amusing enough it came in the form of another spiral staircase enclosed by a dark evergreen bark, the same material as the stairs. You know I started to notice something, Iris said as they climbed. I noticed that the stairs leading up to the next floor always give some sort of clue as to what the floor leading up them will be. For example, the floor before the demons the stairs were rocks, and then we went into a mountains area. So I'm thinking with these stairs the way they are we will end up in a forest area of sorts. Iris that's a great find and all, Thrain said, but in truth it's not all that relevant. We don't have many options but to climb the stairs leading up or turn around and go back down, so having the very slightest idea what's ahead of us in these scenarios is meaningless. Whatever we will find on the next floors we will find and have to deal with it to move on. Seeing her dismay Rugal kissed Iris on the cheek to cheer her up and whispered to her, Don't worry he's hard on everyone, especially since we've been in here. Although Thrain was right about how little it mattered Iris' belief that the stairs gave a clue to the next floor was correct. At the next floor they found it was forest of massive dark trees with dark evergreen colored bark. A dense fog coated out areas of the forest and gave off a strange smell. All of them could sense, on different levels, that something was not right on this floor. They didn't know what it was they were sensing but they knew it wasn't good, so they moved forward cautiously, looking around at every step. Before long Adeline said, Guys I can hear something. 
I don't understand what it is, maybe light biting from something with lots of small sharp teeth. I don't hear anything, or see anything for that matter, Rubel said. Perhaps this place is starting to get to you. It's not just me, Lessa hears it too. Despite the minor protests from Adeline, the group continued ahead through the fog forest. They could feel a very light breeze shifting around them, it seemed to shift the fog too as clear patches would roll in, allowing them to see better. As the empty patches rolled in they also noticed the strange smell in the air would suddenly vanish, realizing it must be the fog that smelled. Traversing further into the forest Adeline said, The sounds are getting louder, I think we're getting closer to whatever is making it. I be hearing it too now, Kurt said. Well we still don't see anything, but we should be prepared just in case, Thrain said, draw your weapons as you please. Adeline pulled the bow off from around her shoulders and placed an arrow in line, but didn't knock it. Kurth too prepped his weapon, unstrapping it from his back and relaxing it across one shoulder while walking. Thrain, Garin, and Rugal all placed their hands on the hilt of their swords but didn't draw them. They continued ahead, walking into the thick fog again as it shifted around more. They didn't get much further when Adeline frantically shouted, Above us! As soon as she said it, giant man-sized spiders started dropping down from the trees. They surrounded the group quickly, the one dropped right above Iris. She couldn't react in time but Rugal, in blur of speed drew his sword, and pushing her out of the way to safety, caught the spider on tip of the blade. As it slid down the blade, its blood oozing from the wound, it shrieked and fell silent. Rugal then swung the spider corpse off his blade and pulled Iris to her feet, putting himself between the spiders and her. Instinctively, the group stepped back, forming a circle with their backs facing each other. They could see the man-sized demon spiders had sharp little red fangs, and red streaks like lightning bolts on their legs and backs. Guess we know what was making that sound, Adeline remarked. The spiders then started lunging themselves at the group from all sides. As Thrain, Rugal, and Garin cut them down easily with their blades, Vera and Iris incinerated them with a torrent of flames, clearing up the horde in front of them which was soon replaced with more spiders dropping from above. Adeline fired her arrows rapidly but there were too many for her to handle so Lessa, with her arms transformed into bear claws again, ferociously slashed at the spiders tearing through them like they were made of cloth. Adeline then put her bow back over her shoulder and pulled her long daggers out and started fighting them up close. Making quick jabbing strike into the spiders' faces and pulling back before they could sink their teeth into her hands. Meanwhile Kurth openly swung his great axe back and forth at the spiders, as if it were a sickle and he were cutting down some long grass. Each swing he took out four to five spiders and even as more came at him he kept swinging. The man looked like he could start singing a song while he killed them. The spiders were ceaseless and seemed like it would go on until the group simply ran out of energy. However that changed quickly when one of the spiders got the drop on Adeline from above. It landed on her heart, throwing her on her back and knocking her daggers away. The spider immediately went in for the kill trying to bite into her neck. She got her arm up in time to block it but its fangs were sharp and pierced through her bracer. She grunted in pain and went to kick it off her but Lessa beat her to it, grabbing the spider with one hand and smashing it into the ground with the other, spraying blood all over her and Adeline's legs. Adeline's eyes went to the trees above for a moment and saw countless more spiders ready to jump down on them. Above us, Vera, Iris, burn them! Adeline shouted in panic. The girls looked up and saw the spiders just as they began to jump down. Together, they unleashed a torrent of flames above them, which incinerated the spiders and started causing their ashes to rain down on the group. You know it was hard enough to fight with this thick fog but now the ashes are really making it difficult, Garen half shouted to Vera and Iris. He's right, we can't fight like this can you clear up this fog a bit? Rugal asked. Yeah sure, you're welcome for that big save by the way, Iris replied sardonic. I got it, Vera said in irritation. She then waved her hands through the air in a sort of dance, catching the ashes as they fell and pushing them, along with the fog, back several good feet away from everyone. The fog clearing up indeed made it easier to see but the spiders outside of it suddenly stopped and started hissing. They began to retreat, back into the fog. Realizing what was happening Thrain said, That's it, that's their weakness the fog. They can't seem be outside of it without it hurting them. The fog slowly started creeping back to them and with it the spiders. Vera was catching her breath when she said, Obviously, but neither me and Iris can keep pushing it back like this, we need some rest. You don't have to keep pushing it back forever just keep it away from us as we move to the next clear patch that blows in. He turned to Lessa and said, Lessa go climb the tree and search the closest open area without fog. 
Lessa went to do as he said but Adeline stopped her and shouted to Thrain, No. I'm not letting you put her in that much danger again. You got a better idea. Thrain snarled at her. Vera and Iris can't keep this fog off us forever and we all need a moment's rest. She's the only one who can climb fast enough to spot a safe area in here. Adeline went to argue more but Lessa tugged on Adeline's arm and gave her a defiant look, she was going to do this to help them. Lessa then focused on her camouflage abilities and then disappeared to climb. She returned not a few minutes later and conveyed to Adeline her message about seeing a large clear patch off to their left. Iris and Vera pushed through their exhaustion to push the fog aside ahead of, and around them, towards the clear patch. Thrain and Kurth stayed in the back to keep the spiders off them while the fog crept back up so the girls wouldn't have to spend even more energy on the blind spot. The clear patch wasn't too far away but without Lessa to guide them to it they never would have found it. It was an enormous area without fog so even with the light winds pushing the fog around they had some time to rest. Iris and Vera were more exhausted than the others, they used the most stamina casting all their spells. Even while resting the guys formed a circle around the girls prepared in case the spiders decided to come out of the fog. I don't think we have more than half an hour in this spot at the very most, Thrain said. Adeline I know you won't like it, you either Garen, but we're going to need Lessa to go into another dangerous situation. We need her to use her camouflage to go around the spiders and find the stairs. I hate to say it but I think Thrain may be right about that, Rugal said before Adeline could protest. Our only other option would be to descend back down to the swamp floor and rest up for a day or two and then push the fog around to search for the stairs leading up. I would much prefer that plan, Adeline said sullen. There is an even bigger problem with that though. If we go searching for the stairs and don't find them in time, before Vera and Iris run out of stamina to push the fog back, we'll all be killed. We wander in here blindly and we won't be able to find our way back to the stairs descending. Then why not just cover small areas at a time? Go day by day and map this damn place out until we find the stairs. Because that can take weeks, months even. And the longer this tower remains the more it sucks up the life from the lands all around, time is not on our side. Adeline went to say more but soon realized Lessa wasn't around. She got to her feet but she couldn't see her anywhere, she must have gone through with the plan without telling her. She turned to Thrain, who was still facing away from her looking out towards the mass of spiders waiting in the fog, and said, I hope you're happy now ass, Lessa went out to search for the stairs. She's the best chance we have and you know it. Thrain said, still not turning to face her. I should have just taken her and fled the forest and leave the kingdom to its own devices. Coming here was a big mistake. Thrain turned to face her now, glaring at her, and what if this tower doesn't just stop at sucking the life out of the kingdom's lands? What if it swallows all of Grimner, then where would you run? Adeline had no answer for that. You're right maybe, you should have left Evercane to its own devices, you owe it no loyalties. But the fact still remains that we don't know when or if this tower will ever stop sucking the life out of the lands, we couldn't find anything about it in any of our history books. But let's say it does eventually stop absorbing the life from the land, what does it do with all that energy? What if it goes towards fueling these demons, and what if there are even stronger ones further up? Perhaps what comes next is the demons leave the tower and go around our world slaughtering anyone or anything that comes across their paths. We might have come here to save the kingdom initially but there is a very really chance that more than the Evercane kingdom is at stake here. Maybe not all of Grimner is in danger, but from what I have seen of this place so far, it seems the most of it will be if no one stops this thing. While Thrain and Adeline argued Lessa had returned to the group. Gleaming in sweat and out of breath there was a light of hope in her eyes. She conveyed her message to Adeline and Adeline translated to the rest of the group. Lessa said she found the stairs, but they're about a few hours from here at walking pace. Thrain looked over to Vera and Iris and asked, Do you think you two can make it? Or should we turn back and rest a couple days on the floor below? The girls looked at each other's then back to Thrain and Iris said, If it gets us away from all these fucking spiders and keeps us from going back to that swamp then we can yes. Then we make ready and move just before this clear patch recedes too far. They took their formations when the clear patch put the spiders within just a few feet of them. With Iris, Vera and Lessa in the front and Thrain and Kurth in the back, they went forward at a brisk walking pace. Even with the girls keeping an open area cleared of fog, where the spiders dared not go, moving through the forest with the demons always surrounding them was terrifying. 
Garen Rugal and Adeline kept their weapons out and their eyes on the spiders that moved around the cleared paths. The spiders never dared to go outside the fog. But as they continued on Vera and Iris began to feel the bitter wave of exhaustion and messed up on a few backlashes of their wind force, causing the fog to come up to Rugal and Garen for a moment. In those brief moments the spiders rushed at them. They fought them off easily enough until the girls got the spell back under control. Vera and Iris started making more and more slip-ups now and felt like they could collapse at any moment. How much further? Vera struggled to ask while she continued her magic. Lessa started pointing frantically ahead and Adeline translated her body language. Lessa says the stairs are just up ahead, only a few more minutes at this pace. Is it straight ahead? I can't see through the fog. Iris asked. I think so yes, Adeline said. Tell everyone to prepare to run. Me and Vera will use the last of our energy to push open a large path ahead through the fog, we can't keep up like this. Adeline conveyed the message to Lessa as Vera and Iris began counting down together out loud. When they got to three they used the last of their energy to clear out a wide path of the fog ahead of them. It pushed all the way back to the wall where they could see the stairs. The girls then collapsed after that. Rugal, in a blur of speed, caught Iris in his arms and dashed for the stairs. Garen scooped up Vera along the way, everyone else easily got ahead of him. Everyone but Garen made it to the stairs before the fog started closing back in around them. He went as fast as he could but the fog returned before the stairs before he could make it and spiders blocked the way immediately. He couldn't fight while holding Vera, so he had only one thing left to do, plow through them and toss her to one of the others on the stairs. Taking a couple steps back Garen prepared to charge when Kurth and Rugal burst through the fog by the stairs and in maddened frenzy started hacking down the spiders before them, opening up a path for Garen. Hurry up! Rugal shouted. Garen hesitated no longer and rushed blindly through the fog into the stairs. He tripped on the first step as Kurth and Rugal accidentally stepped over him on their way up. They stopped as soon as they saw him lying on the steps still holding Vera close trying to protect her as she was still unconscious. He quickly rolled on his butt and started scooting up the stairs best he could when he saw that the spiders were not coming up. Looks like these demons really won't leave the floor they're on, Rugal said, but that was still way too close. Garen got to his feet, huffing for breath and said, Yeah, tell me about it. Kurth offered to carry Vera but Garen only smirked and said, I think you did more than enough for now. You should relax I can at least handle this. Kurth nodded and moved on ahead. Rugal had already moved on once Vera and Garen were safe, he had given Iris to Thrain to carry as soon as he realized Garen wasn't right behind them. Kurth followed with him without a word. But now Rugal wanted to carry his lover on his own. When Rugal caught back up to Thrain he gently took Iris back into his arms. Are they okay? Thrain asked as they continued climbing. Yeah they made it just fine, Rugal said, trying to hide his bitterness. I didn't expect them to collapse like that, if I had known I would have at least caught Vera and carried her. I know you wouldn't want anyone else saving Iris. Of course, Magisters are too valuable to die first. Rugal said derisively. Thrain ignored it and asked, So how long have you been able to perform those magical bursts like I use? I never taught it to you or Garen, did you learn it on your own? Iris had been slowly learning it herself over a couple years so she could then in turn teach me. Since it was evident you wouldn't be teaching me anytime soon. It's a good thing she did too because without it I wouldn't have been able to save her or Garen or Vera. Not even Kurth knew that the two were not with us until I went back for them, not like even he could do it alone either. You should have taught it to us, or at least Garen, before we came here. Because the next time you make a bad assumption I don't think that the luck, which has been keeping us from dwindling in numbers, will hold out again. 